Hey everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave answering questions from tested patrons about my early employment history. Uh, and there was some specific questions that delved into my experience in theater. And those, those are the one, that one of those is the one I'm answering today because theater is absolutely where I got my start. Um, the first play I did was uh, the, uh, the Sound of Music in seventh grade. I played Franz the Butler. And later, uh, the next year, I was we were I was in the Canterville Ghost. I played another butler. Uh, I went to high school and found the drama club, and really found my people in a in a deep and abiding way. Uh, that's where I found my first real peer group that I felt accepted by. Uh, and then I found an art form that is like no other. Theater is an amazing transformative art form and I love pointing out that there are things that can happen in a theater there are experiences you can be led to that you can't get anywhere else um, so today's question comes from Kenneth Stark and he says I love the backstage theater experience 100% Kenneth I frequently think that the show backstage is often better than the show on stage sometimes when you get to see all the all the people working um, can you tell us about some of your favorite theater shows or elements you have worked on? Um, my love of making came from my carpentry and welding in theater. Mine too. Um, I've had some tremendous theater experiences. Uh, when I first moved out to San Francisco, I wasn't looking for work in the theater industry, but a friend of a friend of a friend had a job at this experimental theater company here in San Francisco called George Coates Performance Works. They were in a newly discovered theater in the Hastings Law School building down on McAllister and Market, across the street from the Scientologists. Uh, and I spent several years working for George and working on shows uh, at the GCPW. And uh, then uh, that led to, uh, I got a bit of a reputation, a good reputation in the theater industry. And I started working for other small black box theaters like Project Orto, uh, Oh my God, I worked for the Eureka Theater Company as their master carpenter for an original play they put up called La Nona. And while I was building the sets for La Nona, La Nona and this is my first gig as a master carpenter, and I was not a master carpenter, that was just the job title. Uh, as I was building the sets, it was, a, it was a big job and we were doing like seven days a week. And so on the weekends, I had to work a little more quietly because the show that was currently in the theater was playing. And uh, the audience response to that show was amazing to hear from the shop because they were laughing hysterically, but you also heard gasps. You heard so much audience involvement in this show. And I'm sad to say I never went and saw it. I'm appalled to tell you that that was the very first American run of Angels in America um, was playing at the Eureka Theater while I was building sets in the shop next to the theater. And I never went and saw that first run. It is one of my regrets. I don't have many. That's definitely one of them. But you wanted some behind the, stain, behind the scenes experiences. So working in theater, like I said, I started to get calls from other places. And I got a call from a man named John, John Kamayani, who was the stage manager at Beach Blanket Babylon, which was for 35 or 40 some odd years, a San Francisco institution begun by Steve Silver. Uh, it is a campy musical review featuring giant wigs, giant hats, giant dresses. When I say giant, I mean like 10 foot high hats on dresses that were made out of welded aluminum structures. And I built many of those welded aluminum structures. I worked on some of the hats and wigs, but mostly I was a backstage technician for this show. And this show was a trial by fire. There were five backstage positions and every single one of them had 200 plus cues in the 80 minutes that the show took to play itself out. There's just constant scene changes, actors coming out, making one joke, coming back in and having a full costume change for that one joke. And that happened constantly throughout the show. Um, Many of those actors went through flats that would open and close, open and close, open and close. And so you were backstage constantly moving. Our GP was a chiropractor, the lovely and brilliant Jodie Puttaker. Um, and she, that was what we needed. We needed back adjustments all the time for working on this show. Um, and I remember at one point, look, it's a show we did eight or nine shows a week of that show, was it? It was two every weekend. 
and then Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right. It was eight shows a week and they sold, it was like a 450 seat house, but they grossed millions of dollars a year out of there because of the efficiency of the enterprise. I mean, it was really, it was amazing. You know, you ask any concierge in the city 10 years ago, what show should you see? And they would tell you Beach Blanket. Like they just, they were wired into San Francisco. Um, but when you're doing the same show night after night after night with a bunch of great singer, actor, dancer, performers, you get, you get punchy. So there was a lot of very entertaining uh, shenanigans behind the scenes on Beach Blanket Babylon. Two of my favorites. One was when um, two of the actors were making too much noise while we were waiting for the curtains to open. And uh, the assistant stage manager, Libby Kava, turned to them and just went, Mute! <laughs> I Even she was surprised that she was coming up with a visual equivalent of pushing up mute button. And to be fair, this is like the early 90s. So mute buttons were still fairly new on television remotes, right? Like we're less than 10 years still from like dial volume on the televisions. Um, there's some way in which her yelling mute backstage made us all lose our shit uh, and laugh throughout the whole show. Oh my God, there was another one where uh, my, it was my then wife and I, uh, were going to go to a friend of mine's prom. He had a big loft on Shipley street in San Francisco, and we were going to go to his prom. So we were dressed to the nines. I was in a full tuxedo. My wife was in a giant gown and, um, I was a understudy backstage tech. So I had to be on call. And that meant that every night I might have to work on Beach Blanket Babylon. On this night, I had called in before the seven o'clock show and there were no problems. I did not have to come in. And then my wife and I get dressed to go to the prom, or the, 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 the Shipley Street prom. And at 9.30, I get a call that Doug, the prop guy, has sprained his ankle and I got to come in. And that almost never happened, that you have to come in between two shows. Um, that's right. There, was, there were two shows on weekend nights. And there might have been, I, it might have been even more than eight shows a week. I get ahead of myself. I had to go in. I was like, oh my God, I'm super dressed up. And they were like, come on in. We'll let you not have to do the clearing at the end and you and your wife can go to the prom. So I came and I did the show backstage in a full tuxedo. <laughs> oh, that crew was so good. I did the show in a full tuxedo and my ex-wife and I then, well, we were then married. My wife and I then jumped into a taxi, rode over to the Shipley Street prom and promptly we're voted king and queen of the prom because we were so uh, overdressed. It was perfect. And then, right, I forgot about this. The musical guest at the prom was was Super Diamond. And Super Diamond played, um, you know, play me while we slow danced as the king and queen of the prom. But that's not my favorite behind the scenes memory from working in theater. Um, when I first started working in theater, like I said, I worked for George Coast Performance Works. And I worked on a show called The Architecture of Catastrophic Change. Uh, George had had a big show that was going to go up at ACT the year before in 1989. And the Loma Prieta earthquake had uh, destroyed George's show. It had required, it, it had broken parts of ACT's main theater. Um, parts of it fell on George's set. He had to clear out. And so this big show that was supposed to happen that was like a big thing for GCPW to, to have a, a show at ACT, never happened. And so the following show was all about that, was all about the earthquake, was all about natural disaster and our response to it. And I, like I said, it was called The Architecture of Catastrophic Change. And there were some amazing singers in that. Um, some Eastern European singers, Susan Vulcan and her partner sang, uh, Aurelio, a, a local opera singer, and then this eight-man South African a cappella singing troupe called Zulu Spear. And Zulu Spear was like the heart of the music of architecture. And they were a, 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 an incredible bunch to work with. Um, it was like wrangling cats. And I was assistant stage manager for a fair bit of time on that show. And wrangling the cats of the of the Zulu of Zulu Spear was not easy. Um, but at the beginning of the show, the show opened with them singing this beautiful a cappella song. Uh, but they weren't seen. 
So what you had to do as ASM is you gather them together, which itself was not easy. And then you had the radio on talking to the stage manager and the stage manager say, lights out, go, audience out, go, okay. Cue Zulu Spear. And you'd be in the middle of them. I would be standing in the middle of this group of eight large South African men and they would start their singing. And I'm not only hearing it all coming from I'm not hearing the beautiful sounds of their voices just coming through them, but I'm also hearing it through the sound system of the theater. And to this day, those of us who got to do that cue remember it as like one of the more transformative moments that you could ever have in a theater. It was such a beautiful sound, such an a transcendently beautiful sound. Aaron Kate Wickham was the a, a stage manager before me um, and yeah, she told me, you're going to love this cue. <laughs> and it was incredible. Every night for weeks, I got to hear them sing that opening song, just like right here, like a private concert. Nothing, nothing was better than that. Um, the thing I love about what happens backstage at a theater is because it, it's so important to what happens on stage and yet it is so different. So it really is like watching... The reason magicians don't reveal their magic tricks is because most of them are, are ridiculous solutions and you'd be disappointed in most of the solutions. Um, but the backstage of a, of, a, of a theater show is like the revelation of a magic trick that is just as satisfying as the actual trick itself. Watching the crew of a stage show make that show happen is an unbelievable machine to watch work and to get to work on. All right. Thank you, Kenneth Stark, for that awesome question and allowing me to walk back through just such an amazing moment. Thank you guys so much. Tested patrons, keep submitting your questions. If you want to know how to be a tested patron, their answer is in the comments below. And I will, as always, see you guys next time.